Good morning, and welcome to First United Methodist Church of LaPorte, Texas. I'm Kevin Gilmore, and I serve as the pastor here, and I'd like to welcome you to this online service of worship on Sunday, November 15th, 2020. Today, we are celebrating generosity as we uh, conclude our Contagious Generosity Sermon Series, and we are also uh, concluding our... Um, Time of generosity this year where we've looked at what it means to be generous and, and what it means to, for God to be generous to us. We've continued asking the question, where would you want me to be in my giving, God? And so uh, at the close of our service today, we'll invite you to mail in your uh, estimate of giving cards if you'd like to make any changes to those. Um, we're standing in the sanctuary this morning because I wanted you to see uh, the beautiful altar that we have decorated here with uh, celebrating all of the ministries that you make possible here at the church with your giving and with your generosity. And so I thank you for all that you do to make these things happen. I hope you will enjoy this time of worship today. Enjoy. Gracious and loving God, I invite you to live in my life today. Here is my face, smile through it. Here is my mouth, speak to someone with it. Here are my ears, listen to someone with them. Here is my heart, love someone with it. Here are my hands, touch someone with it. Here are my arms, hug someone with it. Here are my feet, walk with them this day. Here are our gifts, help someone with them. Feed someone with them, build something with them, heal someone with them, reach someone with them. We hold our hearts out to you today and ask that you infuse us with your generosity, love, and commitment to share our gifts with others. Thank you for every gift we have received. Thank you for every opportunity to serve you. With grateful hearts, we join together as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Mark 12, 38 through 44. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. 
They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And now, God, may your word be proclaimed, either through me or in spite of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Several years ago, I read an article about a wealthy widow from Indianapolis who was found dead in her home. Mrs. Marjorie Jackson, dressed in flannel pajamas and a housecoat, was found on her kitchen floor. The article stated that they determined there was no foul play involved. But the strange part of the story is that the police discovered over $5 million in cash stuffed in trash cans, shoe boxes, drawers, toolboxes, paper bags, the pockets of clothing, and even in the vacuum cleaner bag. Most of the money was in $100 bills, Two million dollars of the money was found stacked in a trash can right next to her bed. Again, they did not discover any foul play. Mrs. Jackson was the widow of a very wealthy husband who had left her an estate of over 14 million dollars. There were two brand new Cadillacs in the garage, each with less than a thousand miles. In the past, police had responded numerous times to burglary and vandalism reports at her home. But when they arrived, Mrs. Jackson was always order them to leave her property. 
when police arrived to investigate this time. They had to cut three padlocks off the driveway gate just to get on the property. The front door had three deadbolts and all of the windows were covered with bars. What a sad, sad life. You wonder what happened to cause her to, to close off from the world like that. Maybe this, this widow suffered from a disease that some have called affluenza. The, you know, the sickness of being so affluent that your money and your things control you instead of the other way around. This morning, I want to look at a, another widow with a very different sort of story. We find the story of this widow in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. As Jesus is, is teaching the disciples, there are also uh, people watching. They watched as lots and lots of wealthy folks dropped their money in the offering and, and made this big show of it. Then they watch a poor widow come and drop two copper coins, representing about a penny's worth of money, in the offering. Jesus then says to the disciples that, that her offering is of much greater importance to the kingdom because she gave out of her poverty rather than her abundance. Jesus points out this widow in the temple, and in doing so, he was celebrating her generosity. As we compare the two widows, we see Mrs. Jackson was a wealthy, uh, the widow in our gospel story was poor. Mrs. Jackson hoarded her money and was paranoid that someone would steal it. So she hid it all over her house. The widow in our gospel story was generous and she gave all she had. Mrs. Jackson's life was miserable because it was controlled by money. This widow in our gospel story's life, even though she had very little, was filled with joy. Jesus understood the difference and that's why he was celebrating the generosity of this widow. The difference was in their attitude toward what they had. You know, every Sunday as we gather for worship, we celebrate the giving nature of God. God gives us love. God gives us life. God gives us hope. God gives us forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. God gives us his only son as our savior. And we, in turn, celebrate God's generosity, and we respond with our own generosity. So this morning, I want to celebrate generosity and hopefully share how we can do that. First things first, generosity begins with humility. I think we've kind of covered that in this series as we close this series out today. We know and, and we believe the biblical witness that all we have and all that we are is a result of God's gracious generosity. God created us. God provides for all of our needs, not our wants, not our desires, but our daily needs. The talents we have are given to us by God. We use and we build upon those talents and we build upon those God-given talents and abilities to earn a living for our families. You know, we may buy stuff with the money that we earn, but even those things can be attributed to God because we used our God-given talents and abilities to earn the money to buy those things or build those things or make those things or create those things. There is nothing we have that does not come from God. God is our creator. We are the created. God knows our needs just like any parent knows their children's needs. Remembering that generosity begins with humility helps us focus, focus our thoughts, focus our lives upon God. A life focused on God is exactly what God most desires from each and every one of us. Not because God is some old meanie who doesn't want us to live and have any fun, but simply because a life focused on God gives life joy gives life meaning and purpose and 
and quality. Jesus compared the widow's gift with the gifts of the rich and the powerful. They made a big show of their offering. The noise which the rich and the Pharisees made with their giving of their offering drowned out the sound of their gift. However, the noise of the widow's humble gift of two small coins drown out the noise of the temple. Above all the noise of the crowd, the Son of God heard her gift and noticed her humility. Knowing where we come from, knowing where we all are, what we have keeps us humble. Generosity begins with humility. Second, generosity grows out of love. The widow's humility and generosity grew out of her love for God, grew out of her knowledge of God's love for her. In his first letter, John writes, we love because God first loved us. Through the daily blessings of life, through the talents that we have been given, through the witness of nature, and especially through the love of Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, we discovered, we now know just how much God loves us. You know, most of the time, God's generosity, it nearly overwhelms us because we just don't expect it. There's a scene from the movie Seabiscuit which portrays this, I think, wonderfully. In the movie, Tom Smith, an old farrier and horse trainer with different ideas about training and, and which horses have the heart to race, helps wealthy American businessman Charles Howard with an undersized horse with knobby knees named Seabiscuit. His former owners thought he had potential and possibility, but gave up on him because they thought he was a lazy horse. Down on his luck, Red Pollard, an angry young jockey considered by most to be too tall to even be a jockey, was chosen to ride Seabiscuit. All his life, Red has had a gift, but Charles Howard and Tom Smith are the only ones who have ever really believed in him. Red disappoints them in a race when he's fouled and his temper gets the best of him. Doubt fills his mind and he's not sure that he is welcome anymore. But as he's leaving, he remembers the words of his own father. You have a gift. And he returns. And in returning, Red finds acceptance. He finds welcoming and he finds the beginning of healing. Red asks Howard if he could borrow some money, and Howard happily agrees, even though Red doesn't know uh, when he can pay him back. Red asks for $10, but Howard hands him $20. Howard's generosity nearly overwhelms Red. And in the next scene, you hear the effect that that act of kindness had on Red. While riding in a race, he's, he's talking to Seabiscuit and he says, that's it, Pop, that's it, Pop, we're okay now, let's, let's it, it's all right, boy, yeah, let's go, let's go, we're okay, nothing to worry about. His words turn out to be more commentary about his own life than they are encouragement to the horse. You know, we hear, we hear plenty about crime and theft and greed in the news all the time. But we don't hear much about generosity in the news, except really around Thanksgiving or Christmas. But God is always generous to God's children, and God calls us to be just as generous. And out of response to that unconditional love we have experienced, God calls us to be generous. You see, it's not what we have done, but what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. It's not our love for God that makes us generous. It's knowing that God loves us in spite of all of the things that we have done. God loves us. It's not what we do, but what God does. We love God because God first loved us. 
Our generosity is motivated by our reciprocal love for God. That's what motivated the widow. And Jesus noticed. I believe, I believe that that is why this church has been so blessed and why we have always been able to do what God has called us to do. Now, we've not had a whole lot of extras, but God has always supplied our needs. I believe it's because we've been obedient to God's call. God's call to relocate here some 25 years ago now. God's call to look to the future. God's call to reach out to the community. God's call to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. We have been faithful to that call and obedient. And God has honored that obedience. God honors those who are generous. Whether we're generous with our love for God, our love for others, our forgiveness, our grace, or our stewardship of giving. God honors those who honor God. I believe God honors obedience because obedience really grows out of gratitude. That's the third thing I want to share with us today. Generosity responds out of gratitude. The widow's gift of those two small mites, less than a penny by today's standards, was given out of a deep, deep sense of gratitude. True giving always responds out of gratitude. You know, I remember my pastor growing up saying, there are three kinds of giving. There's grudge giving, there's duty giving, and there is thanks giving. Grudge giving gives but doesn't really want to and feels forced into it either by peer pressure or by guilt. Duty giving is giving simply because we know we're supposed to and it's, we're f kind of afraid of the consequences if we don't. But thanks giving gives out of the spirit of love and gratitude, which grows out of a loving relationship with God. Jesus heard the silent thanks that those two little coins made that day in the temple. And Jesus celebrated that widow's generosity. The widow's giving began with humility. It grew out of love and it responded with thanksgiving. Jesus saw and heard and celebrated her generosity. Our challenge our challenge today is to be like that widow. We've been talking about contagious generosity the last four weeks. And as we continue to follow God's lead in taking the next step. We've seen what generous hearts can do. We have faced the challenge of generosity with the tithe. And we've been called to let the fruit of the spirit of God's spirit grow within us. Today we are celebrating generosity both God's generosity toward us and our generosity toward God as we humbly, with love, say thank you to God with the generosity of our estimate of giving cards. The widow in Mark challenges all of us to celebrate generosity through humility, love, and gratitude. I challenge us, I challenge all of us to do the same. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is our uh, Commitment Sunday, if you will. Uh, it's the day that we uh, celebrate all of our estimate of giving cards, and so I know those of you who are worshiping with us online can't turn those in here this morning, but if you would like to mail that in, uh, we would love to receive it. Uh, we'll pray over them as we receive them. So uh, thank you so much for your commitment and your dedication to this church. God bless you. Let us respond to the word of God this morning by affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest
Thank you so much for joining us for this online service of worship this morning. Uh, just one reminder before we go, we are uh, beginning a new mission project that is our uh, angels for the Port Care Center. Uh, we invite you to, to take home an angel. This angel will be uh, an opportunity to bless one of the residents there at LaPorte Care Center. We've done this project in the past, so invite you to pick one of those up here at the church. If you want us to bring one out to your vehicle, we're happy to do that for you. Once again, thanks for joining us here in worship. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen.